Welcome to RPG Reanimators, a podcast for GMs where we dissect horror scenarios and offer our experiences and advice to reanimate them at the table. I'm Nathan. I'm Alex. And I'm Lex. So let's see who's in the waiting room. Today we're consulting on an acute case of game mastered notes and preparation. We'll discuss lessons we've learned from our games and offer our best advice on how to try running horror games at your table. Now, let's begin our consultation. All right, well, you two, I don't take a lot of notes, so I'm expecting the two of you to really teach me what for, because I know you're both more prepared. So let's talk just generally of what do you kind of do to take notes on? What do you look for to start? Yeah, I'm... so after I... No, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so after I've decided that the scenario is worth running because it caught my interest or I really like some scenes, I begin by taking notes. I do my initial read-through. And then on my second read-through, I have my Google Doc on one screen and then the PDF of the scenario on the other. So when I, whatever catches my attention, I start taking notes on. I keep in mind evocative scenes, how what needs work or what needs tracking, like let's say uh, keeping track of people who are infected. Or, um, yeah, we'll just cut this part. Yeah. Okay. No, I think this is good. People who are infected. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 no. keeping track of people of uh, people who are infected, or if there's like a chase map that needs mm. to be like mapped out, or, or if they've because... seen the yellow sign. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So do you try and keep those? How do you organize those kind of notes? Do you do it by player, by event in the timeline? Let me bring up my own notes. While he's doing that, I can say I generally follow a similar scheme. Um, in a lot of scenarios, I feel like they there is generally an attempt to lump details by topic or by person or place, Agreed. but they tend to get scattered throughout the rest mm -hmm. of the narrative. Uh, Delta Green is particularly bad about this. So if I decide to run something, you know, I'll read through it once, make my decision if I want to run it, and then I'll reread it again with an eye for taking notes. Um, very rarely, I'll copy and paste details straight from it, but generally I'll just take sort of my abbreviated takes on things. Um, sometimes for locations that really speak to me, I will write out just some, uh, like a quote or something that I'll highlight that I'll use to introduce that location as kind of like homemade mm -hmm. box text. Um, and try to keep everything lumped under most common sense areas. Alex actually taught me a really neat trick was to use the Google Docs uh, outline, to use the Google Docs outline function, because you can tag in things at different levels from like first indent, second indent, third indent, etc. And then you can create hyperlinks within that document. So I will have, you know, details for a person and then have everything down in there and then have it linked to their home and vice versa. So it makes it really easy for me to search during the session uh, to okay. go through from there. I tend to suffer from taking too many notes. Maybe it's the academic in me, <laughs> but I tend to have kind of too much on the screen. So I end up slowing myself down mid session and then just revert to improvising because I don't have time to read all of the bullet points that I've made for that thing. So I always structure my notes with by location. I sometimes have an introduction section using that Google Doc outline feature. Mm -hmm. And towards the end, always near the bottom, because that's how I operate. I have a statistics table, which I map out after I've identified the key NPCs that might be showing up in combat. Uh, so I can have that index order. And I also have handouts just copied and pasted, like screenshotted mm. near the end that I need to like remember. So that way I can remind myself, oh, this handout needs to be given out at some point. That's, That's interesting. Clever. I keep yeah. a second document with all the creature and NPC stats for combats and things, because one of the worst things that happens to me in sessions is when I have to repeatedly scroll up and down and search between for things. Right. And so just being able to have two separate windows up is um, that's been a huge lifesaver for me. Or I'll just create note cards to have at the table if it's in person. 
I typically don't have that issue because I use the Google Doc outline. I just have a section towards the bottom that just says player statistics or NPC statistics. So I'm not really scrolling. I'm just hopping from each outline I've created. So this little bit of prep that I'm doing actually saves me so much time during the actual game where time is so important when it comes to pacing mm -hmm. and setting the mood. And do you use... Um it seems like that'd be useful for like character portraits and sort of that sort of thing you want to show for players as well. That's actually something that I do. Um, in each NPC entry, I tend to use an AI generator like this person does not exist and come up with a face that is close to what I'm envisioning and keep it right next to that name. So when I click on it, I just have that image to use to describe details for that person. Um, I might have some buzzwords to rely on, but generally I find that having that image will create a clearer image in my mind's eye to describe for players. And if I need to, I'll add it in as a handout. But most of the time, that's just my fuel. Very nice. I like that idea as well. Uh, one of the things I have trouble with is I will use a voice for a character just to kind of distinguish them. And the next time we play, I have no idea whose voice I used for what or what kind of goofy sort of speech pattern they had. So it's not consistent. This is actually something I have some experience with. Maybe it can be useful, I don't know. Um, so two things is I have a pretty limited repertoire in terms of voices that I can put in for NPCs, um, but I have a few buzzwords that I use to describe their overall character. This was sort of an idea that I gleaned from Graham Walmsley's Play Unsafe, but I'll tend to say like mousy stooped shoulders, sketchy, nervous, and generally just from that prompt and the picture, I tend to come up with the same or similar voice each time. Sometimes I will just say like, sounds like Patrick Warburton, and then just use that for fuel to go on. Also in terms of not remembering how they sound between sessions, that's something that I always do is I have a notepad next to me uh, with just a heading that says improv notes. And after the session's mm. done, I will quickly write down everything that I improvised to try and keep it consistent between sessions. Because if I don't, there's no way it's going to be the same. And I feel like it kind of breaks that immersion for players. Yeah, that's a great habit. So when you're reviewing these notes, I find it useful to read it before the next session so we can remind ourselves of what needs to be done or what voices each NPC has. Uh, one thing I also add to my notes going back to that is a section for specific mechanics that are used in that specific mm. scenario. So like mm. if there's some kind of time mechanic or infection mechanic, I'll have that written down and I'll have maybe I'll have a table for it. And also, if I'm unfamiliar with the game system, I would add a screenshot of maybe like, let's say, a Bouts of Madness table. So I could just have it right there in one document, as well as maybe like a combat reference sheet. I think in this case, I'm going to pull out some of my other notes so I can know what I'm talking about more. <laughs> and while he's talking about that, I want to know what is the ratio uh, that you typically use for preparation versus improv? Because personally, doing an analysis of my own GMing style, I would say I have an 80-20 ratio of notes to improv. I'm about the same. Um, I tend to try and over-prepare and then use all of that for improv during the session. Typically by that point, I've taken enough notes that I kind of know this a little better, just like the back of my hand, so I can work with it. And I don't need to fill in that many gaps in terms of improv. There are some times whenever I have some details that are tucked in in terms of like way too much detail that I always end up taking, that I'll just wing it, and then I'll make an addendum and say like, this is actually this. And we'll like black out that text on my highlights. Right, what about you, Nathan? I think for the bulk of mine, I have a actually much lower amount, maybe a 40-60 in terms of 40 prep, 60 improv. But the 40 is with a focus on what is the flow of the scenario. As long as I can get that down, I don't feel like I'm missing too much with a missing name or a missing person. So that's what I focus on. But there are exceptions Obviously, I've uh, been running Impossible Landscapes recently, and that one you really can't fake as much. There's plenty of room for improv, but the preparation wasn't a lot of notes. It was more just rereading and getting it down. 
in short term memory. She, uh, I have read, reread, and read again that book, and I have two separate Google Docs for notes. I have a Google <laughs> Doc for the overall IL mm -hmm. timeline and NPCs and details for sort of the broad scheme. And then I'm going to have a separate doc for each of the chapters as the agents are going through them. Um, finally got my sheet pulled up, and actually it was my Impossible Landscapes one. This was actually a habit that I learned from Alex that I do recommend is starting the top of... Actually, no, I learned it from both of you. How about that? Start the top of each of your notes with a player character section and have each of the agents, investigators, whatever, uh, and then just some relevant details for them, their bonds, their motivations, their secrets. So whenever players are talking, that can give you some fuel to maybe think of something to entrench their investigator. Then a section for NPCs, then locations, then sort of key events and other details, and then a miscellaneous section, which is to Alex's point, that's where I would keep notes for like contagion and spread and things like that yep. just for a quick consultation. Alex, I'm curious how your notes layout may vary. Yeah, so as I said before, it's mostly uh, an introduction because you got to start off strong when you're GMing, I would I would argue, because that first five minutes of when you start a game, it, especially with like new players you haven't played with, that sets mm -hmm. the tone and mood for the rest of the, the session. And you want to start off strong. So I usually have a introduction section uh, that will introduce the characters. And also I may have some box text that I write beforehand because box text and, and don't un underestimate box text. Box text is really nice when you want to have a very evocative scene that uh, they want to just you want to just describe and get clear to your players. So yeah, I start off strong with the introduction. I do have the key scenes that need to be done. And then I have the locations and very important NPCs are after that. And then there's the statistics. Cool. Uh, as for the locations, right? I'm going through every location before the game and I'm trying to imagine myself. I'm trying to visualize what the players would interact with uh, in terms of their five senses. And I will mm. write it down in each specific location or even in the key event, because that's that might be uh, applicable. I like that a lot because you could start and focus on a single sense and then repeat that every time you return to the location, but add some of these extra senses as you go. That's also something I recommend. I tend to, especially in locations, I will just have a few bullet points with different types of senses and sensations. But a big piece of advice that I would give to other GMs, don't dump all of these descriptions at once. Mm -hmm. I tend to order these in terms of the most apparent to the least apparent. If you open a door full of dead bodies, you're going to be hit with a wave of smell from that. And then after they recover and the agent can says what they do in the room, I then describe the dampness of the air, the way the looks of the certain bodies have and be able to sprinkle those details in because it makes the player more engaged with the room and actively contributing with it in their mind's eye. I love that. I also like that that gives you an opportunity for some of the newer games where they'll actually have you ask the player for descriptions. It sounds mm -hmm. like you have a good system to catalog those and return to them later. That's something I'm currently working on doing more in games is having players feel like they can actively contribute to descriptions in the world. I think a lot of players will tend to wait for me to describe things and then operate only within those parameters. But mm -hmm. as a GM, I love it whenever a player says, I want to grab the lamp off the table and then smash it over it. I never said there was a lamp there, but fuck yeah, there is a lamp there now. <laughs> like, I really want more of those descriptions to feel like it's more of a collaborative storytelling, which is what I feel like these games are anyway. And to Alex's point earlier, not meaning to derail us and go back, but in my normal Delta Green games, I also have a dedicated section for the briefing. I hmm. firmly believe in starting strong with a very evocative first scene to set a kind of uncomfortable or at least memorable tone to get people's interest, get them paying attention to what the whole setup is, and then let them go and have more traditional descriptions there. That's interesting. I usually focus on getting a mental image of what the case officer will look like or the location will look like. 
but I don't really take box notes texts. I can't Sometimes say that, I but... do. It's it, I tend to always have my ideas in a quiet, calm, contained space. And then at the session, my brain is just like, ah, dark. <laughs> and so I, I, that's why it's helpful to have it right in front of me. I'm very bad mm -hmm. at improvising new unique details mid session. I'm typically mm -hmm. better just building off of what's there. Yeah. And I would love to add on that by having this premeditated box text, you can think about what you want to convey and you can even write it in, in a poetic way that you can't write something that you have to improv. I agree. The only issue there that I would put forth as a possible pitfall to watch out for, don't become too reliant on that. During a session, even whenever I'm actively listening to players and searching my notes, sometimes those things that I'm looking for get lost in the details and I will tend to freeze up while I'm trying to search for them. I find in those cases, it's more important just to maintain the flow of it and kind of roll with it. You know these things better than they do, I always say to new GMs, the players don't know what the story is as written. The story is what you all tell at the table. So just keep that going, keep it vivid. Even if it's not exactly what you had in mind, don't let that halt the progression of the story. Yeah, and don't get married to your notes. Like Lex said, if you don't say it at the table, it just simply doesn't exist. So you can use that to your advantage. Also, in each location, I bullet point every clue or thing that advances the narrative yes bullet points i highlight those as well like those are the things that i want to make sure that i nail each time i don't understand why don't you just try not forgetting i don't have a memory for that <laughs> also as a slight addendum don't be afraid as a gm just to say hey, I forgot to mention there was this thing. Mm -hmm. This thing, this note was slipped under your door too. I forgot to mention that earlier, but that is there. I think that there is too much of a, an occasional pressure to feel like you are just what you do is that's it, it's done. But never be afraid to say, sorry, that was an honest mistake. The date is this, or this thing happened. I forgot to mention it, but then keep it going. As long as it's a mild disruption and it generally contributes to the story, then I think that it's perfectly fine. And I definitely want to go back to the improv moment where even though Lex and I have like an 80, 20 notes to improv ratio, that's not to say that improv is not important because like no matter what, you're going to have to improv because plans go to shit at the table. Your players play. will <laughs> always come up with something different that you never prepared for in your notes. You don't have that in your box text? <sighs> no, I, that, that is the issue of time. Because we've, we've got limited time. We've got outside lives, presumably. You do? Mm. Yeah. Not so much. <laughs> and sometimes you're just not going to have enough time to prep. And I'd like to know if you're running on a limited time schedule and, or maybe you need to run a game right away because some other GM can't run it. So you decide to step up. What would you find cutting first? Like what's, what prep is hmm. not vital? that you can consider just cutting. You just described my worst nightmare, so I'm <laughs> not really sure. Names. Uh, side characters. Right. For the case where I don't have time to prep, I'm focusing on what's the timeline, who are the major players, and anybody beyond that, I don't really care, right? Like, I'll come up with a name and come up with a person to meet that need, or just use a person that they've already met again. In my personal stance on this, if I'm limited on time, I'd probably cut out the visualization stuff and I'd mm. cut out the box text because that's all flourish. Oh, the box text, absolutely. I thought that that wasn't even an option given yeah. the circumstance. <laughs> Honestly, this may be a bit against the grain. I would be tempted to drop a lot of the intricacies for clues and focus mm. on key NPCs and key locations and maybe some descriptive details and let the players come up with something. And then whenever it seems like that's a good thread and keeping an eye on the timeline, I might then just have them chase that. That can lead to a satisfying conclusion at the table and won't have me just freaking out trying to potentially clumsily redirect them towards what it is as written. Because like sometimes, I mean, in my experience, oftentimes, 
players come up with something a lot more interesting than what I had planned for them to begin with. And that's good because one of the things I love is a player that takes notes that remembers stuff that I forget because I can ask them and say, hey, who is the person that you saw darting in the shadows and you recognize their face? Yes, it's that person again. I have players that take notes and then ask me for verification. They're like, is that the yep. same person? I'm like, yes. Who? Hmm? <laughs> Perish those players. Keep them close. Chain them in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> Unlucky. Uh, if I do have extra time, I will definitely listen to existing actual plays so I can get a sense hmm. of how other GMs are running the scenario itself. And I will keep in mind that Hey, their style is not my style, so whatever works for them might not work for me. That's interesting. And I'm curious to sort of further this discussion because, Nathan, I know you just constantly <laughs> devour podcasts. Yes. I tended to stop listening to APs of hmm. scenarios that I intend on running, with very few exceptions. Um, most of the time because I tend to find myself subconsciously tilting back because that's familiar and I know how that plays out, kind of, sort of. So I tend to just let myself wing it the first time around. I found that it really depends on the type of scenario. Usually one shots, actual plays will be fairly consistent to the source. And that's pretty helpful for running it because you get kind of a by the book look and you can look at what you want to change. Longer campaigns, though. I don't know why exactly it is. If it's just a case of there's more runway for GMs to play with, players take different paths, and that kind of opens up these different areas. But those tend to differ, and those I find very interesting to see where characters are changed, descriptions are changed, even massive events that you might be going, oh, this should have happened by now, but they didn't. That's very interesting. I want to know why they did this over the course of it that's fair and i know that there have been several times that you have just messaged me that like this podcast did this thing in impossible landscapes and it mm -hmm. was kind of interesting i'm like that gave me ideas later i think i should rephrase i would listen to them before i started running it but like mid running uh. i don't tend to touch it because i don't trust myself to stay consistent with what i already had going without getting that tilt i don't know Sounds maybe that's like just me being over cautious yeah, you need brain problems where you consume as many narratives as possible at once. They're all happening in my head. I don't need yes. any other ones. <laughs> so what's everyone's opinion on the creation of handouts? I love it if I had time for it. I love it when other people do it. Oh, my God. Yes. Oh, so you outsource your work to the Internet every time. 60% yes. of the time, all the time. If I can find <laughs> handouts that work sort of with what I'm going for, you bet I'm going to steal that off the internet. And if it's close, I will use my elementary skills with Microsoft Paint and PowerPoint to try and cover something up and make an alteration to make it work. I need to learn how to use Photoshop to try and make handouts myself. It's just, it's so hard and time consuming. And if I had the chance, I would, but oftentimes I can't. Yeah, I wish I had the time slash capability for that. Most of my handouts end up being copy-pasted text. And I'd love to have beautiful portraits and beautiful hand-drawn letters. It ain't happening. This might be a point of contention, but do you highlight your books? No. <laughs> no. I used to, and then it made me sad, and so I stopped. Uh, I know Matt Sanderson would probably crucify me for saying <laughs> if I was young. I didn't know what I was doing. But um, yeah, no, I stopped doing it because I like having the original there. And this is actually something that I always do. I have a physical copy of the book in front of me. I have a PDF of that book running. And then I have my personal GM notes. The physical book, Yep. I liberally use sticky notes all throughout the book to try and highlight different areas, the things that I want to look at since I can't highlight it. And then I keep that PDF open for those emergency control F searches because again, to the point that like sometimes details are spread out throughout the book uh, or scenario, that can be a lifesaver mid session. I found myself going just complete digital. That way I can 
Control F or comment in my PDF and we're, we're guilt free. <laughs> I don't know. I I just like having the physical copy of the book. I think especially whenever players are talking amongst themselves and if someone ever says, I have a theory, that means I am immediately free to look at my book and read through the section for the next area that they're well, going to be getting into. You can do that into. with the digital PDF as well, which is what I do. And you look subtle because you're not looking down at your book. It's all about presentation. I like I like the nefarious. Yeah, they like, know I'm scheming. Book if I'm doing that. Yeah. Mm. So I suppose it's how you want to carry yourself when you GM, because quite honestly, it's it's like a performance. I mean, also though, it's because my work, my job, all in front of computers, all of my RPG groups now, digital, mm -hmm. everything is computers and screens. So I kind of relish any excuse to not be looking at a screen. And also, I like the book for whenever I'm initially doing my readings of scenarios, because uh, I, I get really burnt out on screens all the time. Oh, that's a fair point. Yep. But to your, to your point about GMing being kind of more of a performance and making the players all feel like they're involved, um, this is a little trick that I've learned I really enjoy. On my second monitor, I have a webcam that is sitting on the left side of it. I will make the zoom screen on the right side of the monitor and my GM notes on the left side. So every time that I am looking at my GM notes on the webcam, it looks like I'm making eye contact with people. And nice. I seem to know everything that I'm doing off the cuff whenever I'm just reading the box text that I had put down before. A little sneaky, but it works every time in my experience. Yeah, the alternative to that is just memorize everything, which is not human or improv everything just make it all up i have okay. comments on that i have comments on that and we'll get <laughs> go for it rip him apart i'm tired of his improv superiority <laughs> yes and he should really stop him oh my god get out <laughs> get out <laughs> <laughs> straight to jail i did want to kind of loop way back we talked about taking these notes during a session on kind of things you've improvised how do you translate that then into your notes? Do you kind of go back through and space them out? Do you have a new section that you do? What's that process look like converting post-session? Right. So when I'm taking notes, it's during the game. I'm writing it in a very short form type of way. So like a couple, maybe three adjectives like bald, um, raspy voice, and like occupation and then maybe even a role in the story like adversary mm -hmm. or helper and then after i do all of that when i'm reviewing my notes i place them in either their own section where it's like npcs they've met and the npc section or in the section where they first appeared kudos to you for taking notes mid-session i have a notepad that i always like intend to do it but every time that i try and take notes mid-session it looks like a doctor sneezed while trying to write on a prescription pad <laughs> and I cannot read it. It's barely legible. It's barely even a language. I would even say that it was a very strong skill to, to learn how to type without mm -hmm. looking at the keyboard like that. That has been a lifesaver mm -hmm. every time. But like with me, I always take notes at the end of the session because I tend to be really excited about everything that happened. And at least my short term, mem short term memory is enough that I can keep all of that in mind and write down those details. And then Nathan, to your point earlier, um, it, it depends. If it's a new NPC that they have encountered, I will just give them their own entry in the text. If I had to improvise something because I couldn't remember the NPC mm -hmm. as written, so I just made someone up and that effectively replaced that other character, I will just switch the names and keep those details in there so that the next time I consult my notes for a refresh and read through, I don't get confused. I think one of the more powerful things that we've done lately too, that helps me a lot since I also have trouble taking notes during a session, um, not just from a uh, focus point, but just too many things going on at once is recording scenarios in sessions as you play them. That's something we frequently do when we play for Into the Darkness as well. Tom does an amazing job of getting those in and through. And then I can rewatch them. And then I don't need notes because I just watched the latest session. I think this goes into your unhealthy constant podcast devouring <laughs> uh, habit at this point. But no, I do agree. You're the one that encouraged me to record my Impossible Landscape sessions. Mm -hmm. 
but it's been really helpful for me to at least buzz through. I don't listen to the whole thing, but I might listen to like a little yeah. clip here and there. Like, I remember that skip forward 10 minutes. Okay. And then skip to the end. It is pretty time intensive. That is a, a fault of that method. I can't tell if you're bragging or not. No, that's it's definitely pretty not time a brag. intensive. It's, but some of us are able to commit to sad. it. It's sad. It's not for everyone. <laughs> yeah, I rarely rewatch my own uh, recordings. Mm-hmm. I only do it if there's been a pretty big gap since the last time we recorded. Like, you know, just the cases, scheduling is always the final boss of any RPG group. Oh, I agree. So, yeah, if it's been a month between sessions, oh, yeah, I really need that little refresher. Yeah. One of the things you had mentioned was that notes can be constraining. And I was hoping you'd talk a little bit more about that. Sure. In my experience, again, I tend to over-prepare stuff. I get all of my ideas whenever it's quiet and calm and I can really think and ruminate on stuff. And then during the session, my brain is operating at max capacity to actively listen and observe all of my players, think about things that are going on, NPC motivations, etc., and then move forward next. So I tend to not be able to quickly navigate and think about through for planning during the session. And all of those notes tend to backfire on me. And I have a very bad habit of getting analysis paralysis and thinking, I know it's right here. There's a thing in the cabinet and it's right here somewhere. In... <laughs> and it will just be this pause while I'm trying to desperately scan my notes to find it. And the detail wasn't that important to begin with. And mm-hmm. I've just started learning that like, if I can't find it, I'll just wing it for the sake of maintaining the flow of the session. And it works. Like, if you can't remember it, it probably wasn't that important to begin with. Or if it was, then highlight that and bring it in as a floating clue later. Because it probably Mm. means it can show up somewhere else, to be honest. And if the next session, neither you nor your players remember it, then it really doesn't matter, does it? Actually, here is another counter question for you then. Mm. Since players take their own notes... Do you, as a GM, do recaps? Or do you want your players to do recaps and get an idea of sort of where they're sitting on things? Or in my experience, I always tend to do recaps to make sure they remember where things left off and have the most accurate information. That's a good question. I usually have them do recaps, but as a group, uh, maybe with one person leading if they feel comfortable. But Alex, go ahead. Right, so I've just had a bit of introspection when reviewing that question and it's usually in my like fantasy rpg games i have Mm -hmm. like uh the player or the groups do the recap and then it's sort of augmented by my own recap so i fill in whatever they missed um i don't find myself doing that for like games like call of cthulhu or delta green for some reason yeah same i tend to mostly run call of cthulhu and delta green and in those cases i find that having Critical details are really important, and I really appreciate how Into the Darkness does in-character recaps. I think that it's very fun and adds a dynamic layer. In terms of me running games, especially whenever it's been a few weeks between sessions, I tend to just ask players if they have any questions beforehand, and then Mm. make sure that I cover those during the recap itself, because I want everyone to feel pretty well equipped with at least the core content of the narrative. Well, there's a little asterisk at the end of this. If players do something very dumb and they forget about it, do you as a GM bring that back to bite them? As long as it doesn't like significantly derail the main narrative, I personally relish these opportunities whenever, say, like they give a copy of The King in Yellow to this professor to transcribe mm-hmm. it and then forget that they gave it to him. <laughs> oh, they are 100% going to see a very bad ending for that later. As in, oh yeah, we did do that. Well, I'm going to play devil's advocate here because even though maybe, let's say, a week or two have has passed since the player's actual session, the player characters have acted like... So the player characters are under the impression that no time has passed at all. It's just a continuous thing. So shouldn't they narratively just have that information that's about where i'd land on it too is most of the time if it is in world something they'd probably remember then i'll help remind them but 
there's also cases where I guess part of the reason that that's an interesting question is I try to make sure that players have the understanding of what their decisions could potentially end with. And obviously there are some cases where you don't know where it will end, but most of the time it's not a huge surprise then when something comes back to bite them. They know it's a threat or something could come back. So for your professor example, I'd probably have him call them back because that is the expected result, but that's where you can start adding in that kind of extra layer of, oh, it went bad. It went real bad. I think to me, that's where the failures are oftentimes more interesting storytelling than Mm -hmm. all of these successes. And as a player slash GM, I tend to find those little like, oh shit, yeah, I meant to do that. Mm -hmm. And like, if they just say, yeah, this is what we're doing. We're going to go ahead. I might give some, like ask some questions, be like, are you sure that's everything? And then if they say no, and like Alex, I totally respect your point in terms of like, the player characters might remember that, but also I think that the player characters are also fallible. And when crazy shit's been happening, sometimes things slip through the cracks. And I love seeing those sort of accidental uh, repercussions come back on them. I think that it gives a little bit more entrenchment into the world and showing that their actions have consequences, particularly so whenever it doesn't have actual meaningful consequences on the player characters or the overall narrative. It's just a, oh, I ruined that guy's life. Oh, well, and then move on. I would say that is true but weirdly it only works if your players take notes because i've had campaigns where i'll bring back somebody and i'll be like oh here's this big reveal i was working with them the whole time and the players go yes who are you what are you talking about why why would we know right and it's just a case of there's been enough time in the real world where maybe they don't remember the person it's might even be in their notes but if it's not up kept in their mind you lose the impact and i think that that's where having those gm note fueled recaps can be really helpful Mm. for that especially if it's a big reveal or something that really matters i think this question is kind of just a tangent in terms of If your GM notes are a bit more comprehensive than player notes, and it's fun to have reminders of accidental repercussions, in my opinion. So, to tangent on your tangent, how do the two of you... Tan tangent. How do the two of you feel about having meta-level scenes that the player characters would know nothing about, but recaps information in an interesting way? So... For your example with the professor, maybe you have a scene with just him working in his lab at night and some giant eyeball blinks through the window and then you cut to the players and that gives them an opportunity to go, oh, right, that guy that we talked about, maybe we'll we'll go that way. It's a little meta. Yeah, but it's also a really interesting narrative technique that you can use to remind your players in game it's also very cinematic and i I like that because it makes me think of like tv shows and things to do that i don't know if i could or would do that because it's a bit atypical for how i tend to run things currently Mm -hmm. but i also love the idea if you would do that for something in the future and do that kind Mm -hmm. of memento tease where you see the ending before the beginning actually starts and give the player something to like they keep looking for that and then it happens as realizing that that was sort of a teaser later on yeah that would definitely require some gm prep oh yeah that's <laughs> yeah. a lot of forethought. speaking that's of like notes. very <laughs> yeah that's that's, and that's also, a product of good note keeping i would argue <laughs> that you can definitely do that but it'd be more appropriate for some types of games or systems over others yeah sure sure Yeah, I believe Alien has their explicitly cinematic mode. To me, that makes complete sense that you would have complete other scenes that the players have no knowledge of happening, right? It's it's a movie where, yeah, maybe maybe that's not appropriate for a group that doesn't enjoy kind of the trappings of Mm -hmm. a movie. You could even elevate it and have the player characters play those that are shown in this little 
outside. So let's talk about some times where we've seen this and it impacts a story. What's a time that you've seen a lack of notes or too many notes at the table? Uh, My bad sessions versus my good sessions. (laughs) I've been in games where the GM has not prepared anything at all. And it's, it's really apparent. Because Mm -hmm. with the lack of notes taking and you're just doing pure improv, there's going to be the issue of uh, having a narrative that you can like plan ahead of. Like it's really difficult to make plot twists that you can signal early on be revealed at the end. If you have no idea what the end looks like. Kind of on the opposite side, I've had the classic lore dump encounter where you know, we would be at a con scenario. We had four hours and two and a half is a lore discussion of the setting or place. And it's interesting. It would be fun, but it leaves very little time for actually playing the game among the players. Yeah, that's having a couple of lore dump sessions and being the guilty party in terms of I felt like I was monologuing a bit longer than I really wanted mm-hmm. to be talking. That's what got me started trickling in those descriptions a bit more. To give a solid bit, they interact with something else. Cool. Give another description to break it up some. Yeah, break it up so it's it's nice and chewable. Trickle down lore (laughs) economics, really. (laughs) Right. And just because you have a ton of notes and material doesn't mean that you have to use all of it and say all of it. Like, have some sense of pacing and what needs to be said at a given time. I think in terms of scenarios that I've written, once they hit the table, I find myself jettisoning about nine tenths of the NPCs. And I realized I could have never written them and just had a much easier experience. So that sort of thing is useful for a note side of if you find you're filling up on all these extra little things, just start chucking, know what to cut. Yeah. Whenever I write or am preparing scenarios, I tend to dump non-essential NPCs and just Mm -hmm. leave in sort of blank Mad Lib spaces. Like, there's a coroner. There's a police officer. There's this. Like, I will only highlight the absolutely essential NPCs. And then everyone else, I give myself room to improv this mid-session because it's going to be too much for me to keep everything on track before going. And in some cases those random NPCs turn out to be a lot more contributing to the story and overall screen time than the main ones that I had. Are there any kind of closing notes you would like to have about your notes? Why Make you notes, you notes. idiot. <laughs> <laughs> don't be like Nathan and improvise everything. No, he's a 40, 60 ratio. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think there's something interesting is when it comes to being a player in a game, I take a lot of notes. So going from that side, I recommend players have a shared Google Doc. I usually do this for games I'm in where I will start a doc. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, has player names, who they're playing, and then just notes as we go. And I usually write them in a pretty informal manner. Of if somebody botches something, I'll kind of write it like my character would have. Uh, they fumbled the lock pick and something happened, right? Something to go with there. And people can comment, they can collaborate and make sure the notes match. And it's handy for a one shot if people miss something. It's great for a campaign for people that have to do recaps or want to look back a couple things and get something. And then it's not on the GM to remember something off the top of their head yeah and if you have these collaborative notes different players just pick up different things Mm -hmm. so they'll cover more ground yes i highly second this i really like having shared google doc notes among players that way they can sort of divvy it up more and it's not always so what did happen last time looking at one player um also My player in Impossible Landscapes that does a great job of taking so many notes showed me something really interesting I want to share here. It's a website called padlet.com, P-A-D-L-E-T. 
that they use to create murder boards, as he calls them. Mm -hmm. And it's where you can set a corkboard background and then zoom out to have lots of details and connect threads between different items. So by the end of it, you have a big scrollable image, kind of like the Charlie Day conspiracy theory board meme. And um, it's been really great, especially for Delta Green games and whatnot. Players have all responded really well to it, and I plan to just keep those around as player tools in future investigations. Awesome. You said our, our closing remarks, right? Just to jump yeah, back yeah. to that? Yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah, take so, notes and just find out your GMing style. Find out your ratio. Find your ratio at <laughs> RPG Reanimators. <laughs> We'll just give you a three quiz. easy and we have a Myers Briggs as 10 quiz. questions to <laughs> help you identify are you? your yeah. improvising ratio. One oh, of which no. is your credit card. I turned number. out to be a Nathan. Wow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> which reanimator are you? <laughs> wow. We hope our deranged utterings are helpful in bringing this topic to life at your table. You can join the discussion on Discord and subscribe or follow the podcast to hear more gruesome consultations. Be sure to check out the show notes for links from the discussion, where to find us, and other links for things like handouts and other resources. So until next time, thanks for listening to RPG Reanimators, where your games can die or live on the table. Oh, not me. I beat rocks yeah. against each other. <laughs> That's my problem. <laughs> I've, I've only got the one rock. <laughs> I just use head. Yeah. <laughs> First make headache, then make headache go away. Much smart me. Mm, very nice.